Hello friends, I hope you are well. Techman Pat here. Today we're doing a PC gaming build and of course that means we're going to go through every single step because why not? It's going to be a long video. We're going to go through every one of these parts in detail and even some feedback on every one of them. I always have a comment because during a build you'll find things that you might not find on the box or on the instructions. So stay tuned for that. Now first of all, this is a video from an Australian YouTuber of course and that means all the prices are in Australian dollar ruse. And of course, we're going to be linking back to where you can buy this. So huge thanks to the sponsors of this video. Of course, PLE Computers, where you can buy every single one of these parts. The guys over there can also build you this computer and they also give you some great advice, which I did actually have to ask. Google just didn't have the answers, but they had the parts I needed. Secondly, crucial for sending me this, the T700 and the RAM. Now, there'll be a separate video on the performance of both these solutions, but we'll talk about the speeds of it when we come to the part installing it into the computer. And thirdly, Logitech for sending some accessories to go with this computer. We're going to have a deeper look into them later on in the video. They sent a keyboard, a mat, and this little guy right here, which we have already done a video because I just couldn't wait. I wanted to get using this Pro Mouse right here. So I'll link that below. So with that in mind, make sure to like this video if you did subscribe if you want to support this channel and let me know below if you'd like to see more builds like this. I love building computers. It's the best adult Lego ever and I'd love to do it more often than once every four years. That's my cadence so far. In any case, let's get started by rolling the intro. All right, this is the Thermaltake DistroCase 350P. It is a mid tower and it is around a thousand Australian dollars from PLE, of course, links below. It is a medium tower, which means it doesn't really have a lot of space. In fact, the space that it has can only fit a 360 rad, which kind of reduces our options for cooling. It means that I have to get a very thick rad and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The big selling point of this case is really really that distribution plate on the back. This also makes this extremely expensive. The case comes with a D5 pump, and that's always a positive, two hard drive bays, and of course a motherboard tray. And then there is a little bit of storage below to fit the power supply unit and a bunch of cables. But by no means does this case have enough ways to hide cables. Some of them will still hang out. We'll have a look at that in another section. One thing I didn't like about the D5 pump is that the cable is unbraided. It has the big bright red and black cables. Of course, it makes sense, but it'd be nice if it was nicely covered so it wouldn't stick out like a sore thumb. The glass panel is tempered and overall the build quality is pretty darn good. And it has to be because it's going to be running water throughout the back of it and then the frame of of the actual computers connected to the plastic frames. They are very thick, and as you can see, there are plenty of screws and bolts holding it all together. So far, it's been really, really solid. The motherboard I chose is the ASUS Tough Gaming X670E Plus with Wi-Fi 6. It's an AM5 motherboard. We are building a Ryzen gaming machine. And a couple of reasons I chose it, aside from Wi-Fi 6, I did want fast Wi-Fi just in case I couldn't get a cable to the computer, but it also has a PCIe Gen 5 M.2 slot. And that makes it a little bit future-proof, but we are also putting in a Gen 5 M.2 SSD. Aside from a little bit of future proofness, it's also for me to be able to review and benchmark Gen 5 M.2 SSDs in the future videos. The motherboard also has two other M.2 slots, four RAM slots, and most importantly, plenty of RGB headers. In regards to building, the motherboard standoffs were a little bit of a hassle. Every time I screwed them in, the plastic adapter that came with the motherboard was actually kind of breaking since it is plastic and those things are metal and they weren't going in that easily. So I guess the cutting of the holes for the screws or the standoffs wasn't the best. The Ryzen 9 7950X, oh man, this CPU runs so hot. Obviously AMD is still trying to outdo Intel in every single benchmark. And what they have designed here is a CPU that runs at 95 degrees out of the box 
works by default without any overclocking. So what actually happens is it reaches 95 degrees and then the performance throttles down. So it will just turbo up to the 5.7 gigahertz until it reaches the 95 degree temperature. So what we're hoping to do here is actually cool it down for it to run much higher frequencies. For the power supply, I chose the ROG Thor 1200 watt from Asus. Not only is it very efficient, but it also has the eight pin power supply cable to the graphics card from one cable, technically, because at the other end, when you plug it into the actual PSU, it does actually split into two eight pins. But when it plugs into the graphics card, it is one cable. It looks nice, it's tidy, and it also means it's a much safer and more robust connection to the power supply rather than having those four dangly things with an adapter. This is a very wide power supply because it has a screen on the side that is very useful to tell you how much wattage it's actually pulling from the wall. This is one of the big driving factors for me to actually purchase this PSU because I wanted to use it in my benchmarking and stability testing to know how much is actually being pulled from the wall. And I really didn't want to buy more equipment to try and measure things. Secondly, the distro case has a little viewing window that fits perfectly into this power supply. And that means not only does it hide all the cables, but you can nicely see the wattage from that little viewing window. Secondly, the distro case, because it is a medium tower, it means that this power supply is sitting flat rather than back onto it like my previous case. But it also means the fan that's up top might be getting a little bit less air, which shouldn't be a problem unless I'm smashing 1200 watts. EK Quantum Velocity water block is full nickel. It's very, very pretty. Uh, interestingly, the box doesn't match the actual product. This is a see-through acrylic on there, but in fact, this is a full nickel one. Now this CPU water block doesn't go across your V Rams. You know what? I don't mind, but I did like the way my previous EK water block covered the entirety of both the CPU and the VRAMs around it. It looked really nice, but this one and this motherboard hasn't got a model like that, probably because it didn't really sell, sell well and probably because the performance didn't really change much. When you install this, you have to remove two little hinges. They're the ones that grip the cooler onto it. The water block came with Thermal Grizzly, which is really good. You can use also the included EK one, but since you've got the Grizzly one, you might as well use that one. It's much better. So know that when you buy it, at least you get a good thermal paste in there. As always, remember to remove the sticker on the bottom of the actual cooler. Sometimes I hear a lot of people don't and it wrecks their temperatures. I've had some concerns about this not sitting quite right. The way you screw in this water block is actually opposite of the way you'd be doing it from the top side, which means that when you go left, it'll tighten and when you go right, it will loosen. It was a very weird sensation, but it's just a way to be able to do it without having any visible screws on the top side where the nickel plate is showing. It does mean it looks really nice and clean. At $299, this is the one of the more expensive water blocks, so I expect fantastic performance. Unfortunately, the 7950X just runs all the way to 95 no matter what, and this water block might not really be able to do much except just deal with the 95 degrees of temperature. And finally, the RGB. It has a little bit of RGB just on the slither between the nickel and the plastic housing, and it looks really, really nice. Really slick and not too overbearing. For large storage, we have a Western Digital 10 terabyte hard drive. It is shucked, which means it has been removed from one of those external enclosures. I cannot imagine the logic of paying more for the hard drive by itself than buying one inside an enclosure and then just using that inside your computer. Do note that a SATA power plug does not work with a shucked drive. You need an adapter from a four pin Molex cable to then a SATA plug. There is a pin in the hard drive that's literally built to stop you from using this inside a computer. Okay, radiator time. This is the EK Quantum Surface X360M and it comes in black and a little bit of a silver trim. It is not cheap at 225 Australian dollars, but what it lacks in reasonable pricing makes up in its size and cooling performance. Now, because this 
case has only space for basically one radiator. I wanted to make it as thick as possible and then use a push-pull configuration with the fans. This does mean the whole configuration can get quite a bit warmer than other setups with two rads, one radiator for the CPU and one radiator for the graphics card. But because it can't fit, I wanted a solution that gives me enough thermal dissipation and also doesn't make the case look ridiculous. So remember, the thicker the radiator, the more fins air can get across to cool more water at a time. Now I will do some actual thermal performance testing at the end, so stay tuned because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how well this performs. The fans I chose are the Lianli Unifans AL120s, they're the V2, there's also V3, so probably go for that one nowadays. But these ones were in what I would call my price range versus what they look like. I think they look really, really cool. They have this sort of lighting effect that makes it look like you're looking down a tunnel it's like a couple of mirrors in there and it looks really, really nice. At $159, they are expensive, but they also come with one really cool feature that is now very popular amongst premium fans and that is pin power. Basically, you've got little pin pads in between each fan. So when you stack them next to each other, they'll actually power each other and control the RGB. So you only have one cable going to the last fan to control it and power it. So in this build, because we have have six fans all together, I was able to utilize only two cables to power all six. And unfortunately with this distro case from Thermaltake, the power cables to the fans do hang down at the bottom. I have an idea for the future to maybe braid them together to make one solid one and then maybe try and connect it to the under base. But for now, they're sort of hanging there and not looking that great. The actual performance of them is really good. They get very nice and quiet. And when they're loud, they're not that loud and we'll have some sound tests in this video too. So please stay tuned. And while you're down there, subscribe and like. Now I mounted them in a push-pull configuration, pulling from the outside in through the two fans and onto the motherboard and GPU and CPU. Now the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to get cool, fresh air through the case, even though it's got no actual uh, sides or top panels or anything like that, only the glass. I didn't think it'd be good for the hot air that's around all the components to then flow through and try and cool the radiator by pushing it the other way. Which also means that the fans do have that little back bit there that holds the actual fan motor. It doesn't look that nice, but at least they have added a little RGB just to the outside there and looks reasonable enough. I know there's actually other fans from other brands that you can swap the fan blades and have the push-pull configuration with both sides showing just the fan blades. Let's be honest, cabling is the worst part of of a build. Trying to hide all those messy cables to make the outside look nice, knowing that underneath it's an absolute mess. I was gonna say other words, we've all been there. Connecting everything was a bit of a chore. The case has a hinge that allows the motherboard to open up, which is good and it's a must, but then when we get to closing it, it's another story trying to fit it all in. All the cables are very rigid, they're very thick, and there's just literally no space. I wouldn't be able to fit another 3.5 inch hard drive. In fact, the one that I already fit in there, I was thinking I might have to pull out just because I couldn't close the bay doors. Now, it is a little bit bent once I did screw it all in, so there's plenty of tension. I also made sure the motherboard wasn't affected by the metal's tension, and it seemed to be okay. I loosened a few screws to allow a bit of slack and then just slightly tighten them back up. It, it did help. I don't see any bends. Now, I managed to hide a lot of cables, but remember, once you've mounted this and put on your water cooling to get behind and get those cables, you have to drain the loop. So make sure you do it right the first time. Now, since there are two Gen 4 PCIe M.2 slots, I thought I'd throw in some old crucial M.2 SSDs I had lying around. One priced in at 127 and the other one at 76. Both actually are one terabyte each and also perform reasonably well. The P3 is much faster and of course the P2 is a little bit slower. The nice thing about this motherboard, it does come with a plate with some cooling pads that passively distributes the 
heat across this metal plate cover. So first of all, big thanks to Crucial for sending me the T700 for review, which means I also got to use it in this build. So check out the links below where you can get it. It is not cheap at $736 at PLE, but this is a PCIe Gen 5 NVMe M.2 SSD, which means it can hit some incredible speeds. In fact, it's over 12 gigabytes in sequential read and 11.9 in sequential write. These are speeds that are only possible on PCIe Gen 5. And Crucial's T700 is in fact the leader in these speeds. The two terabyte is particularly expensive, but if you wanna go for a very fast one terabyte, it is just shy of $500. There's also a four terabyte version, which is a little bit more expensive again. The drive does get hot hitting almost 60 degrees during a stress test and so that heat sink that you see there is literally the only thing saving it from burning up. It is a pretty good heat sink. It's passive and that means you've got to have a little bit of airflow in your case, but it's going to manage nonetheless. I thought I'd leave this on instead of the one that came with the motherboard. I believe because of the thickness, this one will be a bit better to dissipate the heat. Time for some RAM. This is the crucial DDR5 Pro RAM. It can do 5600 MT which is mega transfers. And I've put in here four sticks of 16 gigs, each giving us 64 gigs of RAM. It is of course compatible with XMP 3.0 for Intel, but because this is an AMD build, we are going to be using the overclocking platform AMD Expo, and that's all fine and dandy. It pretty much matches XMP performance. So big thanks to Crucial for sending me this kit for review. There will be a full review video, so make sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for that one. The PCIe extender was by far the most tedious part of this build. I in fact went through two cables from different brands to try and make this work. And the problem was that the 90 degree adapter didn't have a way to sit in the thermal take case. And the thermal take case didn't come with any metal adapter for the now front facing graphics card. In the past, I've just let it hang underneath near the PSU, but in this case, because it's so tight, this PCIe extender was 300 millimeters and it just, it was so tightly packed, it's bending and I just couldn't find any solutions. PLE did help me to use this one. This was the closest one that actually worked. Every other one was either not a PCIe 4 version. Some of them specifically omit that they're not PCIe 4 and deep down in the details, you can see it's PCIe 3. Now, I don't know the exact difference apart from the fact that there's more shielding on the PCIe 4 version. So maybe there's not actual performance difference, but I don't like the fact that they hide those details in there. So the 300 mil PCIe 4.0 extender here was the only one that was 4.0. The cables were thick and I bent it enough and it still works. I don't know how long it will survive, but I've had to replace one of these twice already on my old build and that didn't even have the big bend. It says high flexibility, but the flexibility for this build had to happen right at the joint where the graphics card sits. Finally, let me let loose some frustration. $119 for a cable extension is absolutely ridiculous. There is no way the bomb cost is anywhere near $100. I know it's a limited item, but this should be at least 20, 30, 40, $50 max, but 119 Australian dollars, shame on you, Thermal Take. This should be included in the case that you buy for $1,000. How ridiculous. The RTX 4090 AMP version from Zotac. It is $2,800 not cheap at all. But at the end of the day, this is the only card right now that I could see really using it. I mean, why not, right? I want a game at the highest frames, I want a game at the highest resolutions. And with the fact that I was planning to buy the latest Samsung 57 inch ultra wide dual 4K screen, I needed something that's gonna give me a bit more frames than the AMD equivalent. Even though the RTX 4090 doesn't have a supporting display port 
for that monitor. But now enough about that monitor, this card is beefy, but mainly because of its incredibly large heatsink. I think the card itself could have been much smaller if Nvidia wasn't trying to beat AMD so hard and made the card get so hot. So these board partners have to build incredibly large heat sinks. As you can see, the actual RTX 4090 card is tiny compared to the entirety of the heat sink. So when you do water cool, you are also reducing the size of the card and the space it takes up in your case even though you then have to add a whole bunch of things like a pump and a reservoir. If you would like to see my review of the card, links below, but overall the card performs extremely well. And I'm hoping now with some water cooling, I can overclock it just a little bit more to squeeze out every single frame out of this card. And after all, why not? I've purchased the hardware, I might as well make the most of it. But do I actually recommend the 4090 as a card to buy? Not really. The price to performance is not great and the price itself is ridiculous. When did we get to a point that $3,000 or at least almost $3,000 is justifiable for a gaming card? After all, the PlayStation 5 at around $700 performs reasonably well almost close to the 4000 series. Maybe not the 4090 with ray tracing and whatnot, but the price, well, the price difference is incredible. And so I'm part of the problem that lets Nvidia get away with it. I bought the card, but I think the race is heating up and AMD 7000 series has caught up. And I think the next generation was going to convert a lot of old Nvidia users. So let's jump into water cooling the card. The GPU water block. The most tedious part of the build, a lot of very tiny cuts have to be made to the heat pads and of course a lot of little screws and it all has to be done very very carefully not to damage anything on a particularly expensive graphics card. It was a slow process for me, I believe the whole thing took about an hour, an hour and a half. I had some beer to keep me company and the instructions from EK were actually quite reasonable. I did follow them along and you know what, I didn't think that any of them were a bit too difficult or hard to understand. I have done this before a few times, but this was the first time I was doing an active water block, which is having both sides of the graphics card cooled with a plate. And this is the unique part, and I guess this is where the price comes in at 679 Australian dollars. It means that the card is cooled from both sides with liquid, which is fantastic instead of one side and the other side is usually left empty, or if you pay extra, you get a back cover. But but in this case, both sides get water cooled. It helps with performance and longevity of the card. Keeping components cool is the best way to have your card last long. Unfortunately, the worst thing about this kit that I found is the fact that there's no spare plate for the graphics card. This Zotac AMP4090 has a three slot plate. And this just doesn't work well when you've got a water cooling build that needs to sit a little bit further away from the motherboard on a PCIe extension. There's just not enough space for it in cases like this. It would have been nice for EK to include a single slot plate for the actual card, which probably would have added maybe a dollar or two more for the bomb cost. And the part that makes this a water cooling build, the fittings and tubing. Well, of course, the tubes were the cheapest part of this, which is good because you'll go through a few trying to make the right bends. Now, in my mind, I had a hard time justifying more than $5 per fitting. PLE has some that are around $50 to $70 for three. And I just couldn't justify that cost. They didn't look any different than the $5 ones I have here. So in regards to this build, the flow I was going for is pretty simple. We've got the radiant which is quite thick and the case does allow multiple sizes of that radiator. So I've put it in the top port there with a very short 90 degree tube. But if we look at the start and the pump, we start off with the first fascia of the graphics card, which flows into the back cooling plate and then goes into the CPU on a, again, very short run. One that doesn't block off removing the RAM. Then that goes straight back out to the radiator on a swivel joint to make it a little bit easier 
easier to align because not only is it on an angle, it is also offset from the actual 90 degree fitting that I have on the CPU block. And it can move the liquid quickly through the loop back out to be cooled in the radiator. The build was complete, everything was in place and it's time to fill it. This is the most stressful part of any water cool build. Will it first of all not leak? Then is the actual parts going to run? Because most of the time people don't decide to check all the parts beforehand, they just get straight to building. And you know what? I'm one of those people. Now I know the graphics card worked, but I don't know what happened to it after I actually put the water cooling components on. And it's really unsafe to turn it on without it being cooled. So there's really no way to check. The CPU can obviously be checked with a air cooled unit. But again, what if there's cracks in the distro case? Do I fill that with water first? What about the radiator? What about the fittings? The ultimate test of faith in your own skill of putting a computer together. But it's not all luck. I did plan this out to be as simple as possible, especially with the water loop. I really wanted it to flow as quick as possible through the actual system and out to be cooled. I didn't want any complicated loops. I didn't want to take the chance because not only am I doing it for the video now, I also use it to edit all my videos and then game on. I kind of need a machine that works and is low maintenance and hence using distilled water rather than some sort of colorful coolant. And I know a colorful coolant would look amazing, but it will also require a bit of maintenance over the next couple of years. And you know what? Those years come around pretty quickly. Before we get into the temperatures and noise test, let's talk about some of the accessories with huge thanks to Logitech. We've got the G915 TK. AL. It's a mechanical keyboard. It's wireless, which is awesome. And of course, it's nice and clicky. This is my daily driver in the large size, and I'm really excited to try out the TKL version. So having a lot more space on my desk, obviously bar the numpad, which, you know, some people do like, but I don't mind at all. I might be able to just use the number pad. Now it does have a little hidey hole in the bottom there to hide the receiver and it's really, really nice quality. Then we have the G8 4.0 XL gaming mouse pad, a very smooth cloth mouse pad. It comes with a very thick rubber base. And even though it's rolled up in the package, as soon as you put it down, it's pretty much flat. And after a day, you won't even be able to tell that it was rolled up at all. Then we have the mouse, the Pro X Superlight from Logitech in red this time. It is a fantastic mouse. Check the links below for a full review of it. I absolutely love it. And it's really, really light as it says, in the description. Then we have the G435 Lightspeed Wireless Gaming Headset, very nice quality wireless headset. I do actually recommend these guys if you are on a budget, mainly because of the quality of the audio. It's pretty good for what you get. And it does come with a USB-C charger, which is always appreciated. Okay, temperatures. Obviously the 7950X runs very hot, no matter what you do. So the CPU idles in at 56 degrees, while the GPU is at 30. Ambient is around 22 to 24 degrees depending of time of day. It is nearing summer here in Western Australia and it's only going to get warmer. Obviously the aircon and the fan would have to be on to keep this system a little bit lower than the current temperatures. The CPU, I'm not too worried about it. It does hit 95 to 96 at actual full load, but the GPU never goes above 60, which is pretty darn awesome. The 7950X is an interesting choice for the water cooling build. First of all, it runs really hot. It's designed to run hot. If you can reduce the heat or increase the time it spends at a higher spec while at 95 degrees, you will squeeze more performance out of it. But it does run hot and that means it will heat up the entire loop. At the end of the day, the 7950X will throttle if it goes above 96. You can obviously turn that off and let it burn itself out, but preferably don't do that. And secondly, I'm kind of disappointed in AMD for letting the CPU get to those temperatures, even though they say, oh no, it's fine, it's fine. But I just don't think any silicon at those temperatures is doing well. It's also utilizing a lot of power. 
I saw it peak at around 800 watts. And after all, you do still pay for the power in your home. Even if you're living with your parents, somebody is still paying for it. So having your CPU and graphics card draw so much is I think a little bit ridiculous. But if you can cool it down enough, you'll at least squeeze out some performance. The room has gotten very warm during the times when I'm using this computer to its full potential. In gaming, I average 600 watts on the power supply and that is basically because the CPU is just not being utilized at all and the GPU is firing on all cylinders and again stays at very very reasonable around 50 degrees. I'm super impressed. Having the push-pull configuration also blow some rather warm air through the components does reduce how much heat there is on the motherboard which is always helpful even if it's not that much. The radiator can manage all this which is even better one radiator which is a thick one of course and six fans so you know what that's a lot of I suppose cooling and look if you are planning on building something similar I can happily recommend using one large radiator with six fans in a push-pull configuration. It works really, really well. But then again, you also have to consider what kind of case you have. I think it would go a lot worse if the case was more enclosed. This is a big open case with just a glass panel out the front. The RGB, of course, is stunning and brave. It looks great on the case and it looks great on the water blocks. I really appreciate the Vector C CPU water blocks RGB, I think it's really sleek. And you know what? The fans are the highlight. That mirror-like finish and you look into it and it looks like you're looking into a dark abyss. I love it, it looks great. And all six of them matching up in the same color is absolutely lovely. So friends, thank you very much for watching this very long build video. I hope you enjoyed the journey of building this one right here. And I have to admit, I've had the most fun in this build. So huge thanks to the sponsors of this video from PLE, where you can of course get most of these parts. Where you cannot, I've put in an Amazon link. Crucial for supplying the T700 and the DDR5 memory, check the links below where you can get those pieces and of course the T700, oh man, that is fast. And lastly, huge thanks to Logitech for sending across some accessories to use with this computer. Of course, the mouse and the keyboard and the headphones are necessities to play some epic video games. Let's quickly talk through the price. The total for the entire build is 9,223. There is a couple of things that we can remove. Let's remove the two SSDs that I got in there. Let's just leave the one T700 and also 10 terabyte shucked hard drive. We are left with 8,660, which is a very expensive computer. Now, Obviously, I'm not counting Windows 11 because you can get that for 20 bucks from one of those key sites. And honestly, it works and I'm not too bothered by it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to reuse any of my water cooling parts from the previous build. And if I could, like the fittings, I would have saved a couple of hundred dollars. I could have also reused the fans, but again, I was looking for a bit of consistency in its look and some fancy RGB. I could have also reused my old power supply. It was a thousand watts. It would have probably been enough but again I wanted the PCIe 5 power supply and I wanted to have wattage on the side so if I do any more benchmarking I could also tell you how much wattage the computer is drawing from the wall. All right folks thanks for watching I'll catch you on another one make sure to like and subscribe and let me know below if there's anything you would change with the build or what parts you'd want to reuse for your own. Love to chat there.